Hello guys and welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all doing happy, amazing and positive. Today I'm bringing you guys another true crime case, the case of Chris Benoit. You probably would have heard of this case because it was quite a famous case and you've definitely heard of it if you are into WWE wrestling. So before I get started, I wanted to just give my usual disclaimer that all pieces of information that I'm going to be talking about today, I have found through the internet, through news articles, videos, news reports, things of that nature. So I do understand that not every piece of information will be 100% accurate. And this video is to create domestic and family violence awareness. And also just a trigger warning guys that this case does have a lot of graphic detail. So if you are not into that sort of thing, please click out right now. I've got a lot more lighthearted content that you could watch. So this case revolves around a former WWE wrestler called Chris Michael Benoit. If you don't know what WWE is, it stands for World Wrestling entertainment and it's a scripted show where they perform wrestling and there's like storylines in it as well. You will know that there are a lot of famous wrestlers out there that have made it into the acting world. People like uh, Dwayne Johnson, John Cena, Kane, Undertaker, um, Stone Cold, Steve Austin. Those are just a few names, a few famous names that have made it out from wrestling or are still in the wrestling business. So Chris was born on May 21st in 1965 and he was born in a place called Montreal, Canada. Chris could speak fluent English and also fluent French. He was quite an intelligent man. His father said that Chris was so obsessed with wrestling, so obsessed that he saw started training for wrestling at the age of 12. He would love watching it. He had so many idols that came out of wrestling. He was always imagining himself in the ring. It was his absolute dream to become a wrestler. Chris's interest first started in strength training and he would actually win a lot of awards for his bodybuilding and wrestling competitions. And after his interest in strength training, he went on to develop his love for wrestling. This was literally thousands of kids dreams around the whole world. At one point, I wanted to even be a wrestler. It just seemed so amazing. He was like, this is not just a dream for me. This is going to be a reality. Chris's inspirations were Tom Billington and Bret Hart. And he would go to a couple of shows where they would be performing. And he just had love heart eyes for those two. As Chris was training for his wrestling, he got to do what thousands and thousands of people only dreamt of doing and that was training in the Hart family's basement which was known as the Hart family dungeon which was a gym slash wrestling school where aspiring wrestlers would go and train and eventually go on to become pro wrestlers and a lot of pro wrestlers who have become very successful did start by training in the Hart family dungeon. This is where Chris knew that he was going to become successful because once you made it into the Hart Family Dungeon, you pretty much made it to be a wrestler. The only way was up from then on. Chris started his professional wrestling career in 1985 where he would have a very successful career for the next 22 years. And he started off in smaller wrestling leagues until people started noticing how talented he actually was. People started chanting his name. People started cheering for him. He was instantly loved by so many people. And because he started becoming loved so quickly, he started getting recognized by bigger leagues in the industry um, that wanted to take him on to work for them. And that is how he started to excel in his career so quickly, is because he had the stage presence and people just loved him. In the early stages of Chris's career, he moved around a lot for his career. He pretty much did what it took to live out this dream and just be the best possible uh, wrestler that he could. He moved to many, many different countries and during his career, he gained a lot of stage names. A couple of stage names were the Rabbi Wolverine, the Toothless Aggression because he didn't have that many teeth, the Canadian Crippler, and the best damn technical wrestler in the world. So he had made 
a huge name for himself. To gain stage names like that means that people really love you and that you are super successful in what you do. Three years later, after he started his professional career in 1988, Chris met his wife Martina and got married to her, where he had two kids with her. They were married for a good nine years until they broke it off. And Chris went on to meet the beautiful Nancy Sullivan. Things moved pretty quickly with Nancy Sullivan, where he even moved in with her very, very soon after they started dating. Nancy was actually having an affair behind her husband's back. She was married to Kevin Sullivan who was a fellow wrestler of Chris Benoit and was a frequent opponent of his as well. So once Nancy and Chris started becoming more serious, she broke it off with her husband Kevin and continued this relationship with Chris Benoit. When Chris Benoit was working in WCW, which by the way was the main competition of WWE um, back in that time, Nancy would actually make appearances with Chris Benoit. Every Everyone knew that they were a couple. Everyone was actually really supportive and really, really excited about it. And Nancy went on to manage Chris Benoit as well. Nancy was actually really involved in the wrestling world way before Chris as well. She was the occasional wrestler and she was a model as well. She made many appearances in the wrestling world under the stage name called The Fallen Angel. Nancy and Chris went on to have a family together. They had their son, Daniel, in February of the year 2000. And then in November of the year 2000, they finally got married. So the biggest gig that Chris Benoit landed in his entire career after WCW was WWE, which is every wrestler's dream. It is the biggest wrestling company out there. Being in front of 80,000 plus people was Chris's dream. He finally made it. There was no going back. For Chris, this was no longer a dream, but a reality. And he went on to be super successful in WWE. He won many world championships. He had so many fans, so much support around the entire globe. He was at the top of the mountain. He went on to become one of the most favorite wrestlers in the world and it happened so, so fast. Vince McMahon, who was a chairman of WWE, was very particular in who he had as wrestlers working for him and he would normally go for like six foot plus men, big guys, you know, people that you would look at and go, yeah, that's a wrestler. But Chris Benoit wasn't six foot seven. He was actually 5'10". But because he was so great at what he did, Vince McMahon was like, there is no way that I'm not going to have this guy working on WWE. We need this guy. And for someone to be under six foot working in WWE at the time was massive. Chris Benoit was a perfectionist in the ring. I'm talking sometimes this kind of perfectionism can be quite toxic. He trained day in, day out. And according to fellow wrestler Chris Jericho, if Chris Benoit would catch himself making even the tiniest bit of mistake in the ring, he would go off backstage after the show and punish himself with like 500 squats. And this was just because of a tiny, tiny mistake that could have been easily fixed. But because he was so particular and so hard on himself, he would go on to punish himself in drastic measures. Chris Benoit's style of wrestling was so super aggressive and some would say very dangerous. He would do these moves where he would like stand on the top of the rope and dive into the ring head first without any protection gear whatsoever. And he would perform unprotected headshots, which meant he would get hit in the head by chairs without protecting himself. And repeated blows to the head like that can become detrimental. And because Chris's signature move was diving into the ring like that, 
he had to do it all the time. Like people would actually come to see that. Do you know what I mean? It's like when Shakira does her hips, like people want to see it. That's what kind of became the image for Chris Benoit. And he just didn't care about any internal injuries because he was so invested in his career. He wanted to make those diving shots look as real as possible. That's why he didn't wear any protection gear or um, dive in a way that would, you know, not hurt his head. But yeah, he just honestly did not care. He, he, was, he felt so honored to be a part of this wrestling industry that he wanted to be the best of the best even if it meant he was hurting himself in the process of it. Other wrestlers that performed moves like that where it would require blows to the head, they would do so in a safe way. They would land safely so that they wouldn't hurt their head and neck. Um, they would cover their head with their arms. But for Chris, it was not a chance. He wanted his performance to be the best of the best. And Chris thought that if he did do it the safe way, it wouldn't look as real. So he went on to do it in the more dangerous way. And it wasn't just one or two moves that he would do that would require continuous blows to the head and neck. There were quite a few of them that he performed without any protection. I mean, if you do it once or twice, you may not notice it, but in the long run, this is so dangerous. So in 2003, three years after Chris and Nancy got married, Nancy Benoit filed for divorce. She said that Chris would often be very aggressive. He would throw things around when he was angry, like furniture. And according to Nancy's sister, apparently there was an occasion where Chris Benoit actually hit Nancy. She wasn't sure whether it was deliberate or not, but she was sure that it did happen where Chris did physically harm Nancy. According to another co-worker of Chris Benoit, Chris apparently uh, broke a windshield of his car. So he was just really aggressive, really violent, and just do things that kind of seemed out of character for him. When Nancy filed for divorce, Nancy's sister came to stay with Nancy in their home while Chris actually got out of the house and stayed in a hotel. And Chris tried to call Nancy's phone many times, but Nancy would not answer. So then Chris went on to call Nancy's sister where Nancy's sister spoke on behalf of Nancy. And Chris said that he really needed to talk to Nancy to kind of resolve things. So he came over over the next day and resolve things with Nancy and after they resolved their issue Nancy dropped the divorce file. She also had a restraining order against him and that was dropped as well. Chris Benoit had a best best friend called Eddie Guerrero. He was also a former really, really famous wrestler. And Chris would confide in Eddie with a lot of things in his life, including his rocky marriage. And he would go to Eddie with everything and anything. Sadly, Eddie Guerrero passed away in November of 2005. And Chris was so devastated. He was bawling his eyes out in Eddie's tribute show. It kind of set him into a form of depression because he was grieving so hard. He just could not come to terms with his best friend's death. A lot of friends and family of Chris Benoit said that Chris never fully recovered from Eddie Guerrero's death. So Chris continued to work even while he was grieving heavily. You know, he would just go to work, come home, do the same kind of routine. But no one really knew inside how upset and how depressed he was becoming. Nancy actually wanted Chris to quit wrestling at this point because Chris would say things like, you know, when he was at work, everything reminded him of Eddie Guerrero. And Nancy said that it was really detrimental for Chris's well-being that he work in the same place that Eddie used to. So Nancy was trying to encourage Chris to quit WWE and start his own wrestling school where he would be able to put more of like positive energy towards and kind of take off his mind from Eddie as well. Nancy was so right because the death of Eddie just changed Chris. In June 2007, this is where things turned a lot more sinister and things went downhill really, really fast. Chris Benoit found out that his friend Sherry Martel also passed away. This seemed like it was just the last straw for him. He just could not take any more grief, any more sadness. And it's like he just had this 
breakdown. The weekend of the murders, there were a couple of house shows. These are shows where WWE would do, which was kind of like in local areas, which were not televised. Chris sent a voicemail to Chavo Guerrero, who was Eddie Guerrero's nephew. They were really, really good friends. Chris said that he was going to be late because he overslept and missed his flight. Chavo called Chris back after listening to his voicemail, and Chavo says that Chris pretty much confirmed everything that he said in the voicemail and also that Chris sounded really really tired and really groggy on the phone. He just did not sound himself. He sounded a little off. So when they hung up the phone, Chavo's concerns kind of grew because he kept thinking about how Chris just did not sound like himself. So he thought he'd call Chris back just to make sure, just to confirm that everything was okay. So 12 minutes later, Chavo calls back, but Chris does not answer. So Chavo instead leaves a voicemail on Chris's phone to say to call him back when he can. So a little while later, Chris calls Chavo back and says the reason that he didn't answer his call was because he was changing his flight with Delta Airlines. And he also said that it's been a very stressful day for him because his wife and his son were vomiting blood from having food poisoning. Then Chava responds and says, look, that's fine. If you need anything, I'm here for you. I'm here if you need to talk. And then Chris responds saying, thank you. Um, Chavo, I love you. And that's where the call wrapped up. And Chavo later on went to say that it was really, really weird for Chris to have said, you know, I love you. And the whole conversation just seemed really off. You know, he just knew in his instincts that something was wrong with Chris. Chris actually ended up not showing up to the show. And when Chavo went to check his voicemails again, he realized that Chris actually sent him a voicemail saying that he was not going to make and the only flight that he could get was landing at 8 a.m. the next day. The next day on the Sunday, there was a huge pay-per-view show where Chris was going to win a championship. The pay-per-view show is like paying a one-off fee to watch a specific grand show. And the strange thing was, was that Chris did not show up to this. He was going to win a championship. You would think that he would turn up to work. And Chris was not really known to not turn up to work, especially if it's like a whole televised show where he was going to go on to win a championship. Everyone knew how much he he loved working and how passionate he was. So for him to not show up was really concerning. Chavo received two text messages from Chris Benoit between 3.50 and 4 a.m. on the Sunday morning. And the text messages read, the dogs are in the enclosed pool area and the back door is open. And then he got another message from Chris detailing his address. The text messages actually woke Chavo up but he didn't really think anything of it because he was actually scheduled to go pick up Chris from the airport in a couple of hours. So he didn't really think anything of it and he turned around and went back to sleep. Chris actually sent um, the same text messages to other co-workers as well, which they were thinking that it was really strange, but it was kind of like, all right, this is just weird, but they didn't think, you know, there was something that bad going on. So Chavo went to go pick up Chris from the airport. And he waited and he waited and he waited and Chris did not show up. And this is because Chris and his family were already dead. WWE found out that Chris sent a series of weird text messages and, you know, he no-showed at the airport. No one really heard from him after that. So they contacted Fayetteville Police Department to do a welfare check on Chris and his family because they knew something was up. The show went ahead that night with John Morrison replacing Chris Benoit. However, WWE did not find out at that point what had occurred in the Benoit home. So officers went to the Benoit home in Atlanta where they discovered the tragic scene. So when they went in to the Benoit home, they soon realized that this was a murder-suicide. It is said that Chris Benoit actually committed these murders over the course of the three days. When Nancy Benoit's body was found, police discovered that she would have been bound by the hands and legs before she was killed. There were bruises on her stomach, on her back, 
and there was a cord mark on her neck and it is said that Chris actually had one knee on her back while he was strangling her from the back with a cord. Her body was found wrapped in a towel with blood on her head with a Bible next to her. The seven-year-old son was also found dead and it is believed that he died of suffocation. It was also concluded later on that Daniel was actually drugged with Xanax, which is not a typical drug that you give to kids. It is said that Chris did this to sedate Daniel so that when he went to kill Daniel, he wouldn't feel any pain. And next to his body was also a Bible. In Daniel's autopsy, there were a lot of internal injuries that were found as well. So as the police officers discovered more of the scene, they found Chris hanging from a lap pull down machine. So WWE found out that Chris Benoit had died. They at this point did not know that it was a murder suicide. There was actually a three hour show that was scheduled to be on. They canceled the show and dedicated that three hour time slot to Chris Benoit and his life and his legacy and his career. The last hour of that three hour tribute show, reports started circulating of what really happened, that it was in fact a murder-suicide. And also those reports stated that the police were not looking for any suspects because they believed that Chris Benoit was the killer. So once WWE found out what had really happened, they made an announcement. They announced that there was going to be no further mentions of Chris Benoit ever again. They removed his name from all the websites of WWE. They removed his biography, names from articles. They removed his signature moves from all video games. Even Chris Benoit's commentary in the video games, that was also removed as well. They just wiped out Chris Benoit's name. It's almost as if he never happened. Ever since then, Chris Benoit's name has never been mentioned on a WWE platform. In Chris Benoit's house, the officers found steroids as well. And at first it was speculated that Chris Benoit had lashed out due to roid rage, which makes you super angry, super paranoid, and act out in ways that you normally wouldn't. That speculation was quickly ruled out because they discovered it was not the roid rage. They said that putting the Bible next to the bodies was not an act of anger. Chris Nowanski contacted Chris's father saying that what Chris could have done could have been linked with the head traumas that Chris would have had. You know, there was years of trauma to Chris's head. There could have been a lot of injury that no one knew about. Tests were conducted and it was concluded that Chris Benoit's brain was that severely damaged that it resembled an 85-year-old Alzheimer's patient. And Chris was only 40 years old when he died. So you can imagine how bad his brain was from all the repeated unprotected blows to the head. Reports said that um, Chris Benoit had an advanced form of dementia, which was said that it was similar to four NFL players whose brains were concussed. Repeated concussions to the head can actually cause dementia. And Chris's father has always said that the trauma to his head could have been the leading cause of the crimes that Chris committed. Other tests revealed that he had swelling of the brain as well, which is really common in sports where there is a lot of head butts and blows to the head. Symptoms of this can include um, dizziness, confusion, and social instability, and also behavioral problems as well. This can also lead into depression and suicidal tendencies, which is quite similar to what Chris was experiencing. Obviously, not all cases would act out the way Chris Benoit did, but it is a possibility if proper precautions are not made when conducting moves that Chris Benoit would do. A former football player, Aaron Hernandez, which you would have heard of as well, he actually had swelling of the brain as well, CTE, which is what he would have had playing football. Everyone knows his behavioral problems as well. You know, he murdered people. He had a very aggressive manner and he, you know, apparently committed suicide as well. So it is quite similar to what Chris Benoit was facing as well. In a study that was conducted of 111 NFL players, 110 of those people died from CTE. So this is a proper 
condition that is so important to look at when performing in these sports because it can lead to deaths. Wrestlers are 10 times more likely to die before the age of 60 because of poor welfare precautions and continuous concussions to the head. What happened to Chris Benoit forced WWE to take care of their wrestlers, to take their precaution measures a lot more seriously and enforce more substance regulations and drug testing because there's a lot of wrestlers out there who do use steroids and abuse steroids and, you know, they do in fact end up having roid rage. In Chris Benoit's urine, there were steroids found, but it's not sure whether he abused steroids at that point. Because they found it in his urine, it concluded that Chris would have used steroids not long before he had committed the murders and committed suicide but it's not sure whether Chris actually abused steroids or not. That's why roid rage was ruled out when they were determining the reasoning of what had happened or how it happened. One other really surprising thing that was found in Chris Benoit's autopsy was that Chris's heart was huge. It was three times the normal size. The examiners actually concluded that Chris Benoit would have died in 10 months anyway because of his heart condition. And it's not known whether Chris knew about his own heart condition, but the examiners did say that that was fatal. And this was the same condition that Eddie Guerrero had when he died as well. In Chris Benoit's time, WWE failed to recognize how dangerous some of these moves could have been. They would have been causing so many internal injuries that WWE failed to consider. After the death of Chris Benoit, WWE started taking their wellness policy more seriously, but not just for physical damage, but also internal, ones that you could not obviously see. Really bizarrely, 14 hours before the Benoit family's bodies were discovered, there was an anonymous entry that was added on Wikipedia regarding Nancy Benoit's death. The entry said that Chris Benoit was being replaced by another wrestler for his world champion match, stemming from the death of Nancy Benoit. How did this anonymous person know that Nancy Benoit had died? The bodies weren't even discovered. No one even knew what was going on. The person who wrote that on Wikipedia just said that it was a huge coincidence, which is a very weird coincidence. And I don't believe that it was a coincidence. There is something more to that. The IP address was traced back to a teenager that lived in the same town as the WWE headquarters. Something's not adding up here. And the town of where the WWE headquarters is was not even where the murders had been committed. So that was something really, really strange. Anyway, that's all I have for you guys for today. I didn't really want to go into too much of the WWE jargon, but this was a case that for sure I had to do because this is such a big name that was in the industry at the time. Thank you so, so much for watching. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. It helps me out so, so much. Don't forget that I post every single Monday. So I hope to see you guys here next week. Stay happy, stay amazing, stay positive. Bye.